beginning of the chapter. So we're into chapter three, and we get some questions. I don't know if you like questions, asking questions, or being asked questions, difficult questions, and um, there can be many trick questions sometimes. And I was reading earlier one in the 17th century called Bishop Gore, and he said, be careful of clever arguments. Not that there's anything wrong with being clever, but that the intellect can run away with itself. And we need to judge things according to our conscience. So don't let your conscience be tricked by clever arguments. Does that ring any bells with things Sometimes people can come up with very clever and you can't actually answer it. But you say, ah, the conscience says what's right and wrong. Thankfully God has given us that and it points us continually to the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes the clever people are too clever for us and actually sadly they're too clever for themselves and they, they are rebelling against God and against their consciences and bringing themselves into God's judgment. But that is the sort of thing we're faced with and we may be tempted with as well, to have clever arguments when actually we're going against the conscience. I, I did have a quote exactly on how he put that nice and succinctly, but haven't got it, never mind. But now, in this chapter, we get some of these sort of arguments being put and the Apostle Paul dealing with them. And as he deals with them, then he's also pointing out some of the great things about God and then we look at it again as some of the responsibilities that we have. So four arguments are put against his case. He's argued that all are basically sinners and he's gone through the heathen world and the vile things that happened and then he's challenged his own people who had God's law and should have known better but he, con he convinced them or was convincing them also that what was needed was a circumcision of the heart. They needed a heart that was for God. They was a Jew, the last verse of chapter 2, he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So, a heart that wants to please God, not to please men. And so, this was to distinguish the godly from the ungodly. Now, the questions come then in, in chapter 3. The first one of the four is, what advantage then had the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Well, he talks about the Abraham, the circumcision in chapter 4. But what advantage then had the Jew then? If everyone is going to be judged according to how the fullness of their heart is committed to God, um, then what's the point? If, if you can be a Jew, but then you can be lost, then what's the point? Well, he says, much in every way, chiefly, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. He's saying it's a great advantage to have had the Bible. They had, they had the Bible of the Old Testament. The people around in the world, they didn't have the Bible. They might, some of them might have known li little, they might have heard tiny, tiny part of it occasionally from Jewish people, but basically they had only the revelation of nature and what was right and wrong, which they could work on the basis of some things they would know were right and wrong. But to have the Bible is a great advantage, and it's a great advantage to us today, of course, to have the Bible. It sets, to try and think how would a person be saved? without the Word of God, without and then hearing the Word of God, gathering and hearing the Word of God as well, it's almost impossible to imagine. So, yes, there was a great advantage then of being a Jew. And so today there's a great advantage of being in a Christian family or context or church where you have the Word of God. You have the Scriptures, not just in the commandments, but also in the promises of God. The Old Testament is full of promises to the people of God. They repent, 
They turn to the Lord, they'll be saved. And it's the same for us in Jesus Christ. If we turn to Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. What a thing. Who would know it? Well, we have the Bible, and it tells us this most amazing news, that the Saviour we're reading about in Acts chapter 3 this morning, how after Jesus had been here, they were preaching about the resurrection and the promises that God was making to all people to trust in Jesus Christ. Well, what an honour it is to have the Bible and what a shame it is if we neglect it. And the second question, as God has given in the Bible promises to the Jewish people, as we read um, in Genesis there, he made promises to Jacob, I will surely do thee good. That's a promise, isn't it? In Genesis 32, verse 12. And make thy seed as the sound of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. What a promise to make to someone, that their offspring will be like the sound of the sea for multitude, thousands and millions of them. And there will be all these people, and it would be to do them good. God said, I'm going to do you good. And all these people, there's going to be a huge family and that was where the family from which Jesus came when he was born when he came from heaven and he was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary brought forth Jesus Christ the son the eternal son of God who came into the world to give himself as a savior oh we're all in Adam we'd all fallen in Adam we all counted guilty with Adam but then this is the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what if some did not believe? This is our second question. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God had promised a people, his people, and yet some of them didn't believe. Does this mean God had failed in some way? Was he unfaithful in his promises? Well, we're told here very strong language um, in the right way something a phrase you'd be you would only be very careful to use verse 4 God forbid the Greek says literally may not be but it needs to be translated with greater force than that it's the only way it can be expressed don't just say may it not be God forbid it's a strong expression so no you can't go around saying that because man has let has been disappointing, that God will be disappointing. God has got a way. You see, this is again, you can see something of the cleverness of man. God's promised this nation, but the people have been unfaithful. What's well, so a God can't do it? Wait, God forbid. Let God be true, you see. We doubt God sometimes. We doubt that his ways are coming to pass, as he says. No, let God be true, but every man a liar. It's not encouraging you to lie. It's saying even if what everyone was saying the opposite, God is true, God is faithful. That's a great thing to know, isn't it? Sometimes you feel like you're the only one. Well, if you're married, you might think there's only the two of you. And then you think the world's against us. But if God's true and we're on the Lord's side, God's faithful. And if man is unfaithful, there's, there's, there's other texts about this, aren't there? Um, God remains faithful. So he might be justified in, thou might be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So God can judge uh, righteously. God is the judge. And when he judges. It's not ruined by man's unfaithfulness. God can judge because he's faithful and true. And that, that verse there is taken from Psalm 51 where in verse 4 Psalm 51 in verse Four, you remember where David says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear. I know my heart. Huh? I know that fear and be my clear heart. when thou 
judges against thee, thee only have I sinned, says David. But he says that God is justified. God is right. And when he judges, he judges fairly and rightly. Now, this raises the third question, which is in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? So, if by people doing wrong, God is unable to judge righteously, can we then say, well, he can't do them any harm then? Because it's all worked out for good. Um, sometimes I don't quite understand that, but some people are very clever in the way they put things, and this is the sort of argument that had been put against the Apostle Paul. That by people being unfaithful, unrighteous, it proved that God was faithful and righteous. So it's good. It's good. It shows up God has been good. Well, you might say well, that's ludicrous, and so does the Apostle Paul. But so people can't be arguing that God will be unrighteous. Of course, the other thing is that all things are in God's hands. He's made everyone and he's predetermined things. But he says, no, sin is sin. God's greater purpose is people delve into it and they think God is unrighteous in some way. His, his, when man has been made by God and God knows the beginning from the end, he says, well, how can God get involved then? Isn't he unrighteous? He says, no, God forbid. For then... How shall God judge the world? You see, sin really is sin, and God's judgment really is judgment. And all the overworkings, if you might say, the, the way that God brings all these things together, that does not take away from the sinfulness of sin. And again, I put it to you as we did at the beginning. The moral conscience beats the intellect. Now, that's not to say that the Bible's unintellectual or something like that. But that cleverness, trying to wriggle around and get away from our conscience is not the way to go. God is righteous and he will judge the world. So we need to be humble before God. Some, there's often this arrogant attitude, looking down as if we could work out everything when we have a fallen mind and will and heart that is liable to deceive ourselves. God will judge the world and we should be glad. You think, well, it's good, isn't it? You think about it. Think about all the evil things. What's going on? How is it ever going to end? And God is going to judge the world. So the people of God who humbly trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, having no righteousness to boast of ourselves, but only of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can wait patiently for the Lord and not try and twist things. Which brings to the fourth question that comes up here um, is if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, this is a related uh, question, why yet am I judged as a sinner? All the evil things that I've done means that God has got a great glory in forgiving me. It's true. The worse you've sinned, the more you've been forgiven, the more you love God. People that have been very sinful, they're amazed. I've been forgiven because Jesus bore my sins on the cross. Isn't that wonderful? But there, then this argument is put here, let us do evil that good may come. Oh, can you believe someone would say that? But that's what they say. And it proves here that what the Apostle teaches, what the Bible teaches, is that if the, this is a proof that we're saved by God's grace alone, not by our works. Um, occasionally we get a bit of a twist in how to express these things, but if you think about it, um, if that's what they're saying to the Apostle Paul, Oh, we can do evil because good's going to come because God's so gracious. They're knowing that God forgives sin. Absolutely. And it's the righteousness of Christ. We'll, we'll come to this further on in the epistle. And so he gets accused 
uh, P was saying, well, let's do evil then. And then we can be forgiven. And it looks better if God's better and better. And it's so amazing. He can be, I can do the worst sin and he'll forgive me. Yeah. But again, it's terrible, isn't it? Yeah, when you, <laughs> if you're a Christian, yeah, it's a very dangerous course to take. And in fact, it says in here, um, rather, as we be slanderously reported, he said, it's not true. We don't go around saying that because we're saved by God's grace, by the blood of Christ. No, rather, it's precious to us. And we're amazed and in awe and we walk humbly before God. And he says, those that say, let us do evil, the good may come. <laughs> he says, whose damnation is just. If that's the attitude of a Christian, I know we, we're going to look back and we're going to say, oh, I've sinned and God has forgiven me again. But a Christian can never could never go into sin, as it were, saying, well, it's okay, because I can be forgiven tomorrow. They say, well, that, that was the old, they say, I don't know if it's even true of them, but they say that that's the Roman Catholic view. Oh, I can be forgiven, I just go to Mass, and I'll say my confession, Ooh, yeah. and that. I'm not sure whether they, there are that many of them that are really that hard-hearted either. But, yeah. uh, I mean, it, they, they, there's a false form of, re, of re, religion, and whether any are so hard-hearted, I think the thing in that case is that you've got a person whose heart is very against God if they want to say well I can do this because I can be forgiven <laughs> they want to tell a white lie or something like that it's again there's no such thing as a white lie um, there may be temptations in these areas and to believe that whatever I do I'll be okay but actually what happens in these cases is it often proves that person with such an attitude is really an apostate they're not a believer at all their damnation is just they have not really responded with a love towards God because they don't know the love of God they may have a, a doctrinal head for some of the teachings that people learn about but not then take it seriously so that's the four uh, questions answered and Paul answers them very severely be, care, be careful of clever arguments against God in favour of sin because there's a judge there and then secondly from this passage some of the wonderful things to turn it round a little bit not people with trick questions but some of the wonderful things that we read here about God again God's character and the things he does firstly he's committed the oracles of God the oracles is 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 the word the uh, it's the pure, plural of, uh, of the word uh, 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 well it's a diminutive of the word logos, word, the word God's words, God's um, teachings have been committed to the people of God he's a God of revelation, he's revealed himself to people, isn't that amazing that God, this powerful almighty God has his words and the people of God have been given his words his truth, the oracles of God have been committed to the people of God what a privilege we always say what a responsibility we have but that's the start then God is faithful isn't that an amazing thing whatever is going to go on I'm going to turn to the Lord and trust upon him to bring to pass his promises the, the covenant that he made with Abraham he brought it to pass that there would be a blessed seed there were many that were condemned there were many that were faithless there were many that perished in the wilderness there were many that rebelled against the prophets kings even they were destroyed but God was faithful to keep his people and he keeps them today now, isn't that a wonderful thing to know about God you think well I'm not that faithful I've let the Lord down well let's keep returning to him with repentance and faith and know that he is faithful to deliver us from every evil work God is faithful and then God is righteous. The righteousness of God. We, our, if our righteousness, unrighteousness, commend the righteousness of God. Well, God is not unrighteous whether he, he takes vengeance or whether he delivers his people. He's absolutely fair. Well, you could be terrified about that. But of course, the only righteousness we read about in this 
epistle in, in the Bible is God's righteousness who people in verse 24 being justified freely by his grace justified, counted righteous through the redemption the purchase that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a, propiti a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past his righteousness verse 26 that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Jesus Christ the Lord our righteousness we saw it in chapter 1 and in verse 17 for therein in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith the righteousness of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness but Jesus Christ the righteous and there's a righteous judgment of God so if we have turned to Jesus Christ truly as our saviour forsaking and hating our sin and loving God then we have come to him who is the righteous righteous you'd be afraid of righteousness coming down on you wouldn't you but it's only because Jesus Christ has borne the sin of his people on the cross the righteous God the judge verse 6 how shall God judge the world it's good and we said earlier it's good that God is the judge how would we know how could fairness and judgment come how could evil be punished and finished with and how could all the good things that God has promised come but God is the judge and the truth the truth of God, a God of truth. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie, etc., unto his glory. We speak here of the truth of God. In verse 4, let God be true. Isn't it the most, the most um, um, un horrible, isn't it? So people think that God isn't true. It's one thing the Bible repeats about God. Well, many things it repeats about God. God is true, the God of truth. He's not lying to us. He's not deceiving us. He's not tricking us. He's good. perfect. Sure. Good, perfect, perfect, and true. There's many other policies of God, aren't there? That the God is the God of love and of grace and mercy. These things are uh, the way that we receive these great things of God. And so, God is a God of of uh, glory. Verse seven: For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory well arguing from if it was a false way that I got but the point of the glory of God is there God is a glorious God and we don't sin in order to bring about his glory but God himself is glorious it's all sufficient he's eternal there was nothing that God needs or needed he's almighty he's everlasting the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons, as they're called, in but one God, and uh, all full and sufficient and glorious. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's something, a, a weight of glory, the expression is used sometimes. The word glory is often referring to something with a great weight to it. Something, you think of it, glorious things on earth. You like the glory of the sun or the glory of the moon or the glory of the stars but God's made all these things how glorious must God be to do that and this Lord of glory the Lord Jesus Christ is called the Lord of glory and his people have a promise of glory to be brought to the glory of God into God's glory it's a word used for heaven and for eternity and there's no pain there, there's no crying there, there's no evil, there's no danger, 
that's the glory of God. Something of it. We can't imagine it. We can't. The Bible says it hasn't come into our minds what the things God will do. We can't explain. We can't uh, capture it all. But we know that it is a very great glory that is promised to his people. But some of the things we see in this passage about the character, the wonderful things about God, rather than that attitude of trying to question and, and uh, trying to get around things in some way, oh, and, and arguing against God. They're, now, the, not to say that we have our difficulties, we have our uh, uh, questions come into our minds, and we think, how can this be? But I commend to you the faithfulness of God and some things for us to do, to beware of a heart that hardens toward the law. Rather, let's say, God be true, but every man a liar. Uh, not that we're accusing everyone of lying, but you know, if there's one thing we can be sure of, if, if the whole world was saying no to God, we say, no, God is true, God is faithful, God is the God of righteousness, of truth, of glory, and he's given us his oracles, his words. God has given us the word of God. Now, the Bible's a big book, and you say, well, I have trouble getting through it all, and you may dip in here, and well, we're together, we're to help each other in understanding the scriptures. We're supposed to have pastors and teachers of the scriptures, to take heed, to listen to sermons, we are to read the Bible. There are many helps available. If you go online, on your computer, there's Bible Hub, and there's commentaries for every verse by proven. Now, you can go to some church, and you know, there's some strange things being taught, uh, really peculiar, but the old commentators have been proven over the years not that they're every point, they'll all agree on the finest tiny point of, of every letter and every sense of every phrase, but the general sense of them, you'll find that they fit together very well, the old commentators like Calvin and Matthew Henry and Matthew Paul and uh, others of them are on there, and you can read their notes right through the Bible, and you'll find the sense when you think, well, what, what does that mean? You can look up a verse, and you can find it. So there's great help. What a privilege to have the Word of God and the essence of it, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest thing in the fullness of time, the Old Testament, so well, it was a bit vague for them. They had prophecies, and they had commandments, they had promises, and they had sacrifices, and they didn't have Jesus Christ. Well, it, they do look to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, but what excuse have we got? If the Jew had an advantage and he, ne and he neglected the salvation that there was shown to him, what hope is there for us if we neglect the great salvation that is revealed so clearly in the scriptures? So let us be those who love the word of God, not those who rebel and argue against it. And may God add his blessing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that the way that the Apostle Paul can be so clear in answering uh, tricky questions with a strong, moral, biblical argument that God is just, God is faithful, and the arguments of men and the trickery falls down. And Lord, may we not be tempted to say that we might do evil, that good will come, or any such slanderous thing. May we, Lord, have repentance. May we be sorry for our sins. And Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit from heaven, the promise that thou hast promised in thy word, the Holy Spirit from heaven to dwell in us, to make us love the Lord Jesus and say, what a wonderful Saviour we have. And Lord, may we live for thee and not twist and distort things. We pray, Lord, by blessing for the people that are from the Jewish people who had the great privilege of the Old Testament. And Lord, we pray that would open their eyes so they may see in those texts the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet that was promised by Moses. In Moses' time, another prophet that would raise. 
Ah, and they must hear his words, and how few of them have. O oh Lord, we pray to thou would open the hearts of many who have been rebelling against God, who have rejected this testimony that we see in Romans here of the sinfulness of man and the impending judgment of God that hangs over us all. O oh Lord, may we confess our sins and others also and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and have joy hope in believing and Lord may we have the words of God in our mouths and in our hearts we may be a blessing to others in the Lord Jesus name Amen, Amen. We'll um, sing again a little bit more